everybody and welcome. I'm glad everybody could make it today. Um, my monthly live stream this month, the topic is going to be uh, safety, uh, primitive pottery safety. So, you know, a lot of what I do is just based in nature, right? But that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. There's a lot of harmful chemicals and other things we need to be aware of. And I don't always go over those in my videos. So today I'm going to try to go as detailed as possible through some of the, uh, the dangers that exist. Uh, in doing primitive pottery and things you need to watch out for and, and some of the things that maybe I haven't uh, brought up too much in my videos uh, that maybe I can highlight for you so you can be a little more aware of. Uh, we got a lot of people here today. Uh, just say hi to some of the people. Look like Angela's here. Good morning, Angela, or afternoon now. Um, what do we got? Johannes Pro. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, hello from everybody. Hello from Germany, Dr. Rattenkaiser. Let's see, Mary McKinnon, hello from Central Alberta. We got people from all over the world here. I talked to somebody from um, Pakistan earlier too. Uh, Europe, Australia, so nice to have everybody here. Uh, I've got some notes here uh, that I'm gonna look at just to remind myself of the, my talking points and then I have a few um, uh, quotes that I'm gonna read from some, um, some more official sources about uh, toxicity of certain minerals and things just so that I can uh, not just be talking myself but uh, reference somebody that knows what they're doing. If you think my audio quality is not good, let me know so I can turn it up. Um, my my stream today is telling me, um, usually it says uh, excellent connection. Today it says good. So I don't know if that means maybe I'm not as um, not as good a connection as usual, but um, let me know if you have any problems with my connection. Um, I announced it uh, a while back, a couple weeks ago, um, but with the holidays and everything, some people might have missed it. I, I am planning a potter's gathering uh, on March 25th and 26th. That'll be, excuse me, out at my property in far southeastern Arizona. So um, if you're interested, that's on my website, ancientpottery.how. If you go to the classes tab on there, uh, you'll find more information on that potter's gathering. So if you're in, you know, the United States, if you're in the Southwest specifically, you might be interested in coming to that. There's no cost. It's just a bunch of potters getting together. Uh, firing some pottery together, kind of camping out for the weekend and uh, having a good time, hopefully. So that's uh, March 25th and 26th, and that's far southeast Arizona. So if you're familiar with southeast Arizona, it's, it's south of Wilcox and north of Douglas. It's, it's, it's right near the Chiricahua Mountains down there. Um, so that's uh, one thing that you should be aware of. My spring workshops are completely full. I have two spring workshops planned, and they're full. So I won't be scheduling any more spring workshops. Um, there may be a summer workshop. Um, there's been some talk about scheduling one in Montana. Um, probably going to Montana in July. And so there's a possibility there if we can find a good spot. Other than that, um, I don't know if we're going to be doing the Q Ranch workshop uh, Labor Day weekend or not this year. Uh, if not, if that doesn't come off, then I'll try to schedule one up in the Mogollon Rim Country somewhere around that time of year. So uh, if you are interested in an Arizona workshop, in the summer, uh, keep your eyes open for that. I do have a monthly email newsletter. Uh, you can subscribe to that on my website, ancientpottery.how. And if you're interested, then you, that'll keep you uh, on top of all the upcoming workshops so you know and can sign up for those. All right, uh, let me go to the chat real quick, uh, make sure I get all the questions. Also, if you have any pottery related questions, uh, it does not have to be related to safety or toxic uh, you know, minerals or anything like that. Uh, if you have any pottery related questions at all, just drop it in the chat and I'll try to get all of those answered. All right, uh, so let me just see what we got here. Uh, Granny Goose is here. Hey, nice to see you. Uh, let, sorry, I'm going to ruin your name. L Lorinda, Lorinda Lakota from Alaska. Good to see you here. Bubba2525. Good afternoon. Hey, Bubba. Um, I will eat manganese for dinner. I don't think that's a good idea, but we'll talk about that. Concerned Pueblo Navajo person. Hello from Laguna Pueblo. Hi, Andy. This is Myron, traditional potter from Laguna. Hey, uh, it's good to have you here, a traditional um, uh, Pueblo potter. Jake Hartner says, I sound good. Hey, it's good to see you here, Jake. I don't know if you've been to one of my live streams before. Uh, I know Jake Jake is a potter up in Kanab, Utah, and I know him from the Kiln Conference. Uh, hello from Sedalia, Missouri. Connection is fine. James Russell. Thank you, James. Uh, hello from Brazil. Nature Morpho. Good to hear that. Uh, you made it from Brazil. Welcome. Uh, Johannes, hello from Norway. Uh, Martha Strogan. Yay, my first live stream. Good to see you. You made it, Martha. Um, 
Where are you from, Andy? Says uh, Shin Chayan Magic Pokestar. I think this is the person who's from Pakistan. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm from here in Southeast Arizona. I, well, I was born up in Washington State, but I moved to Southeast Arizona when I was five. So I'm from here. And I grew up in a town called Sierra Vista, which is uh, southeast of here. I live in Tucson now. but uh, I grew up in Sierra Vista, which is kind of a smaller town. Uh, it's an army town. Ren Pixie made it, or I don't think Ren Pixie has ever missed a live stream. <laughs> First time, Jake Hartner. Good. Uh, Lisa Lovely. Hi. Uh, Gopher, hello. Good afternoon from West Virginia, says Tyler. Nice everybody's uh, made it here. So um, I'm going to talk about a number of different things today. Um, the first subject I'm going to discuss is clay. Um, you know, the, the dangers of clay itself, mostly dust related, but also uh, we're going to talk a little bit about heavy metals in clay as well. Um, and then we're going to talk about pigment minerals. So, you know, when you're making decorated pottery, and most of the stuff I make, if you watched any of my videos, is, is decorated, it has a lot of paint. Uh, different sorts of slips and stuff on it. So we're going to talk about the toxicity of different mineral pigments. Uh, and then uh, we're going to, when we're done with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, fire safety as well. And, and not just, um, not just like making sure the fire doesn't get away from you, but also uh, there are, there are things you can put in the fire, things you can put in your firing that, um, that can create toxicity and actually make you sick. So we're going to talk about that as well. Okay, so that's the subjects we're going to cover today. And then I'll, I'll talk about a subject for a little bit, and then I'll break away, and I'll come back, and I'll check the chat and answer your questions and come back. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat at any point, and if I don't get it right away, I'll, I'll try to get to it before we're done, okay? Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is, um, is clay. So let's talk about how clay settles out in nature, right? Clay is the finest particles of soil, and so um, when 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 there's, uh, when there's water running down a mountain, let's imagine a big uh, rainstorm, a heavy storm on a mountain, and it picks up sediments of all sorts of sediments. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it'll pick up rocks the size of, you know, cars, it'll, big rocks, and then everything smaller than that, boulders, uh, smaller rocks, gravel, sand, uh, little bits of dirt, little tiny, tiny particles of clay. These are all getting washed down the mountain, right? Tumbling down the creek. Uh, now, when they all start, to, some of those some of those rocks, you know, are potentially heavy metals. Uh, they could be gold, they could be lead, uh, you know, they can be arsenic, they can be different things, right? And and so we've got we've got some metal in there as well. Now, specifically, I'm thinking of lead because there's a lot of concern about getting lead in your clay. But there's other heavy metals, right? Uh, cadmium and um, I think cadmium is one of those, um, and and arsenic are, are also heavy metals that are potentially very toxic. Uh, but let's say there's lead. Let's say there's some chunks of lead and they're being washed downstream along with the clay and the gravel and maybe some gold, you know, all kinds of things, uh, quartz. Um, and, and here it comes. It's coming down the hill. Now, the heavier stuff, the gravel, you know, you don't find that out in the, in the valley because it us doesn't get washed that far generally. It'll settle out as soon as that creek starts to kind of calm down a little bit. Those, those heavier materials, that includes the lead and stuff, those, those chunks of, of uh, heavy material will settle first. Uh, the lighter material, let's say, let's say not talking about clay yet, let's talk about sand, really fine, fine sand. That's going to go a little farther. It's going to go down, it's going to get carried down where the water is a lot stiller. And then silt, that's going to go even farther yet. It's going to go farther out in the valley, out in the flats, right? And then that clay, that clay can stay suspended for for days sometimes. And so the clay is way out, you know, on the floodplain of the river or, or in the, the lake bottom or something where it stays suspended for the longest time. So the point I'm making is by nature, by the way these, these um, when water moves materials, it sorts them by weight, right? It sorts them by size and weight. The lighter materials like clay go the farthest. The heavier materials like your lead or your, you know, your Volkswagen sized boulders, those are going to settle farther up the mountain. And, and, and then you can look at like uh, where they do placer mining. So placer mining is gold mining where they're looking for nuggets. And you know, they have the, the sluice boxes and the gold pans. I did some of that when I was growing up. My grandfather had a mining claim and we did a lot of placer mining. And we, did, we looked for gold. And where you find gold, it's, it's right in the bottom of the creek, right up against the bedrock because the gold goes all the way down through the sand because it's heavier than the sand. And it settles along those little rivulets on the bottom of the bedrock there and the same goes for any like heavy metal mercury settles down on those same spots because it's heavier than the sand it goes straight to the bottom 
Uh, and so those heavy metals are sorting out generally. And this isn't always true. There's always a chance of having some heavy metals in your clay. And, and we'll, I'll get to that. But most of those heavy metals are sorted out by the way nature naturally sorts those materials. The clays go farther on. The, the heavy metals, you know, they're all up closer to the mountains, generally speaking. Okay. But now, now there's, there's still a chance that there's some uh, heavy metals in your clay. So, um... There was a study in the journal Nature. Um, I don't have the date on it, but it was fairly recent. I think it was 2020. Uh, the link to this article is in the doobly-doo, okay? And they were looking at people that eat clay. So here's something I always tell people when they talk about, uh, I'm worried about digging my own clay because, um, you know, I don't want to eat lead and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm trying to eat healthy and uh, what, what if there's lead in it? Um, the first thing I tell them is look at the way nature sorts those materials like I just talked about. But, but the other thing is um, um, people eat clay, right? So this is, a, this is a point that is often made. When you, when you drink out of, a, out of an earthenware mug like this, right, you might be getting some particles of clay, but not a lot. C certainly not more than a, a couple of very small particles. But, but some people actually eat clay. So if you go on uh, Amazon, for example, you can find uh, bentonite that is like food grade bentonite that people consume. Um, and and I looked. I used to I used to raise sheep. I've done a lot of different things in my life. So I used to raise sheep in Oklahoma, and um and these sheep had a lot of parasites, intestinal parasites. And one of the things that was recommended to get rid of these parasites was to feed your sheep bentonite. Well, being a potter, I already knew about bentonite and and how it absorbs minerals and locks them away. Just like it locks away the uh, the black carbon designs on a, an organic painted pot, um, that bentonite can actually, if you eat enough of it, it can actually make you anemic because it will take all that iron out of your blood or you know your digestive system, lock it away. I don't know if it can suck it out of your blood system, maybe too. Anyways, it can grab iron out of you, lock it away, and then you know make it pass through you, so your body can't actually use it. So. Um, people eat, I knew people eat clay. And then there's a thing, I think it's called pica, where people have a, like a, a, a comp compelling addiction to eating clay and they eat it a lot, like crunchy little bits of clay. These same people eat like styrofoam and stuff, but, but all over the world people do this. Uh, you know, in Africa, all over the United States, there's people that eat clay because uh, they like the, the texture of it or something, the feel in their mouth. I don't understand it. And then people eat it for health reasons as well, like the bentonite I was telling you about. So people eat clay. And this study in the journal Nature, it wasn't about, uh, it wasn't about earthenware pottery. There, there's very few studies about, you know, metals in earthenware pottery that, or the safety of it. But this was about people who eat, literally eat clay. And so, like I said, when I'm drinking out of earthenware, I'm getting a couple of little, you know, pieces of clay in me probably. Um, when people eat clay, they're eating a lot more clay. They're getting a lot more of it inside of them. So this is what this uh, study was about. And they said this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote directly from the, from the study. The results of our comparison of using three different bioaccessibility assays. So, so they, were, they were looking at how accessible, if these minerals did get consumed in the form of clay, how accessible were uh, to your body were the lead the arsenic, right? How were they were they being taken up by your body, or were they just passing through with the clay? Um, showed that only ten to sixteen percent of the original arsenic and lead content present in mineral clay complexes was free for absorption. So, uh, so of the so of the lead and arsenic that was in the clay that was being consumed, only ten to sixteen percent was was available for absorption in your body. The rest was locked into the clay somehow and was not available to your body. Um, on the other hand, the bioaccessibility values for cadmium were relatively high. However, it should be noted that the initial cadmium content of the clay samples was comparatively low, 24 to 61 parts per billion. This therefore equates to 0.16 something per day. I don't, and I don't even know what that, what that is. It's a strange letter uh, of cadmium consumption by a 175 pound adult consuming maximum prescribed doses of mineral clay product. This estimate shows that the initial cadmium content in mineral clay is below the total minimum cadmium limit established by Health Canada. So, so, so the arsenic and the lead, from what, what they're saying here, is the arsenic and the lead were, um, there might have been, there were, they tested the clay before, before the person consumed it. They tested and they found out how much arsenic and lead was in it. 
Uh, then they saw how much was being available to the body, and it was much, much smaller than the amount that was in the clay. Uh, and then somehow the cadmium was, was not locked away the same way. It was more available. But the amount that they were getting was still too small to worry about. So, uh, it's interesting to know that, and these are people that are literally eating clay straight. You know, like if I took a bite out of this thing, ah, you know, they're, they're not just drinking out of it. They're consuming the clay. So they weren't getting much of it. They weren't getting much of it. Um, and like I said, there, I've seen some other studies, but there just aren't many studies about un, unglazed earthenware. Um, there's a lot of studies related to lead in, you know, in, uh, in lead-based glazes. That's a known thing, and that happens a lot, uh, especially in other places. Like in the United States, you know, you can't really get lead-based glaze. You can't purchase it anywhere or anything. Um, but down in Mexico... Uh, it's a lot more common. So if you go to some of the tourist shops down in Mexico, uh, you can often find lead glazed ceramics. So you have to be aware of that kind of thing. Um, you know, especially those of you that are in other countries where maybe there's not as stringent rules. Um, but but we're talking about unglazed. So we're not eating any, we're not getting any uh, minerals off of the glaze. There's no glaze. It's all clay. It's just clay slips and such. Uh, so clay itself uh, tends to be fairly safe is what I think. Um, let's see now. Let me go back and uh, check the uh, the uh, chat really quick. Um, hello from Tur Turker, or do you mean Tur oh Turkey? Okay, hail DCs from Turkey. Good to meet you. Uh, what's so dangerous? Says Lisa Lovely. Um, I think we're talking about heavy metals, Lisa. Hi from New Jersey, JD Stewart. Glad you made it. Uh, Jerry, hello from South Carolina, Julie Hammer. Uh, hello, Andy, from very wet Central California. Huh. Well, you guys need the rain over there. I didn't know you were getting so much of it. Uh, Purple Pikmin. Hello, Andy. My first time catching you live. Very interesting as always. Thanks. Uh, your country, many people use clay pot and is very famous over there. Tell me. Um, I'm afraid you're not coming through very clear there, Shin Chan. Uh, Granny Goose. Hi, Chris. We're neighbors. Met. Okay. Stephanie Winnie. Uh, it's most likely micrograms if you look... It looks like a U, yeah. It looks like a U, but it's upside down. Yeah, and the G, yeah, that's probably it. Micrograms per day, 0 0.016 micrograms per day, if that's what it is. Anyways, the link to the article, if you want to read it, is is down in the doobly doo. Uh, it, I like, you know, a lot of that stuff is over my head. Okay, um, let me um, let me talk about that dust, and this is the one, this is the one I get hammered on all the time. Um, for people that watch my videos, they're always like, oh, you you got to be more careful about dust. Oh, I would never dry process clay because the dust. Uh, and, and dust is a, is a serious concern. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about dust and why we don't want to inhale dust, why it's dangerous, and how to uh, kind of mitigate that. So people that, in, cons people that inhale a lot of clay dust over the course of maybe years, right, um, they get something called uh, silicosis. Silicosis just means um, uh, that's the disease in your lungs where you've got these little, the way I understand it, there's little particles of, of quartz that lodge themselves in your lung and stay there forever, right? So it's kind of like uh, what people get from, um, um, what's the stuff, um, asbestos, right? That's the way I understand as how asbestos works. You get those little bits of asbestos down in your lungs and they stay there forever. So uh, it's probably similar to that. Uh, and, and, it, and it's an ongoing, it's a thing that a lot of people have suffered from over the years, you know, uh, potters specifically, because they're often around a lot of dusty conditions. Um, and, and this is something you need to be aware of. And, and I don't often, like when I'm processing clay in my videos, I'm not often wearing a respirator. A respirator is, of course, you know, the, the logical thing to do if you're trying to avoid breathing dust. And you can get a good respirator for not that much money. Um, I put a link to a respirator on Amazon down in the doobly doo, it, just as an example. But if you just go and you know just search for respirators online, you'll find dozens of them. And you want one that's good for dust specifically, you know, um, and you want to make sure it's a good fit and all that. But um, the reason I do, I'm not often seen wearing a respirator is my my workshop here, where I'm at right now, is actually outside. I'm on a porch. It's a screened-in porch, so I have I have a screen around here. And if you ever see, hmm, I don't know if I can show you. If you ever see down below my workbench, um, there's a gap. Uh, this wall behind me uh, is just a screen. There's actually a gap at the floor, about about two or three inches between the floor and this wall, 
where air blows. And there's another one at the top. Um, another, there's several little openings, pretty large openings, uh, where air blows through. And, and so this is all really, really well ventilated. Um, and so it doesn't get really dusty here. Now, when I'm grinding, like so, my like corn grinders right here. If I'm grinding corn, uh, grind corn if I'm grinding uh, clay, it doesn't get it doesn't get dusty at all. It really doesn't, um, because the the um, the airflow in here is really good. If you're in a building though, that makes a huge difference. Like that dust can just stay in the air for a long, long time. So you need to be aware of that. And if you are grinding clay on a corn grinder, uh, you probably want to do that outdoors or have a good good respirator um you know just on a porch or something it doesn't have to be anything fancy like a you know like a studio or anything just some place where you can do it where you get good air circulation now when i'm mixing my clay when i'm once i've got it all ground and i'm mixing the clay and the temper i'm pouring between two five gallon buckets i pour it back and forth to get it mixed really well and um and that's super dusty i won't even do that in here in the you know on in the studio because it's it just produces copious amounts of dust so I go out in the yard and I do that in the backyard and um and if it usually here in Tucson we've got a, a little bit of a breeze and it'll kind of move that excuse me move that dust away as I as I do it but not always uh sometimes if the air is kind of still and it starts getting dusty I'll leave I'll just pour it once or twice back and forth and if it's and it starts getting dusty I just go in the house hang out do something else for a half hour or so come back Pour it a couple more times, leave again, uh, you know, so you don't have to hang around and breathe that if it gets dusty. And, and that's one of the things, uh, there's an article linked in the doobly-doo, again, uh, about uh, dust mitigation for potters. And one of the things they said is, you know, if you go into a dusty area, hold your breath, and then as you leave, you know, take a breath and get out of there. And that's, and that's exactly what I do. So if it, as, it, as I'm pouring it, I'll take a breath, pour the clay, you know, and then walk away and take another and take a breath of fresh air, you know, before I leave. So, uh, you know, you need to be aware of it. And, and I don't always bring it up when I'm mixing this clay because I'm mitigating it every day. I'm, I'm thinking about it and I'm not making a big deal out of it. But uh, I also don't want to give you the wrong impression, you know, that uh, this is totally safe to do anywhere because it's not. So um, be aware. Uh, it was brought up in this article and that I linked down there about how these uh, this clay powder can stay suspended in the air for hours. And if it's in your house, the um, the ventilation system, you know, the, the heating and air conditioning unit will pick it up, and move it around your house. So, you know, you may be getting it in your front room, even though you mixed it up in your back room. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, John the Potter, I don't know if any of you follow him. He's a YouTube uh, pottery guy. And, uh, and he had a little uh, a little tool that would tell him like the parts per million in the air and warn him if it got too dangerous. And it was really an interesting video because uh, he was doing stuff with clay, I don't, cleaning off counters and stuff. And, and then, you know, you could see the numbers go up and down based on what he was doing. Uh, and so it was it was real enlightening. So that might be an, a neat video to watch too. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't link that in the doobly-doo, but I can. Uh, so here's the, here's the clues, or the, here's the tips that were given on that article that I linked uh, there about um, managing dust uh, for potters. Uh, here it is. Uh, work cleaner. Be dust smart. Keep scraps off the floor. Pick up crumbs before they are walked on. Sponge up spills right away. Spread plastic film on the floor for easy cleanup after messy jobs. Don't generate as much dust. Catch it at the time of generation. For example, don't just dump dry clay into the glaze or clay mixer. Put it in gently so less dust is raised. Be more patient. Pick up all crumbs before they get walked on. Clean at the end of the day so dust generated during cleaning can settle out overnight. If you have to place your face in the dust, do not inhale until you are back in the clean air like I talked about. Handle unloading of dry materials and putting into lidded containers outdoors, again, like I talked about. Launder clay clothing often. Remove clay shoes and clothes when entering your house. Dusting and sweeping puts the dangerous fine particles into the air. Silicosis-sized dust goes right through vacuum bags. Heating and air conditioning systems can circulate dust to other areas as well. So uh, these are all good tips for managing the dust in your workspace. And, um, you know, I, what they didn't really say, that is my favorite tip, is, you know, do that stuff outdoors. I know a lot of them, um, a lot of, um, 
a lot of things that that like studio potters do uh, may get clay more places than than just hand building, right? Because like if you're throwing, like I don't I don't know, I've never thrown a pot, right? But like if I watch like Simon Leach uh, throwing pottery on his YouTube channel, he's got clay everywhere, right? And he's wearing an apron, and he's got clay all over the front of his apron. Like you never see me wear an apron, and the reason is I don't I don't get clay all over the place. Um, and that's not I'm not saying I'm neat, I'm not. <laughs> uh, the reason I don't get clay all over the place is hand building. I don't think gets throws clay around quite as much as, as wheel throwing a pot. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, hand building like this is a little bit tidier on the clay. I don't, I really don't get it all over the place the way I see other studios looking, um, you know, regular st uh, potter studios. So uh, let me go back to the chat, make sure I'm caught up on the uh, questions here. Uh, Puppet Bike Chicago here. Hey, good to see you here from Chicago. Uh, hello from cold and rainy England. Morning mist. Glad you could make it, even though I'm a little late in the evening there. Uh, Clarice, hello, Granny Goose. Uh, Michael George, you're the man, and thank you, Michael. Stephen Winnie, I live in cranberry country and have three foot thick layer of pure clay, two foot down. That sounds awesome. Uh, it it does not so awesome for uh you know for gardeners, but it's awesome for potters. Processing my first clay lately. Cool. Silicosis is my favorite ice cream flavor. <laughs> I bet. I bet that's good. Uh, it's not very common. I used to work in a pottery studio and lots of people were very interested, but only a fairly small sunset actually have used pottery. Uh, I usually do pottery outside under the roof, but no walls. Um, I think dust is more of an issue for enclosed areas. Yeah, definitely. There's a good subject. Maybe you should make a video about it. Uh, about what? Um, safety? Uh, you know, I, I thought about making... The reason I'm covering this issue here in the live stream is it's been on my subject list to make a video about for a long time and it's just not a very, it's just hard to make a really good entertaining video, although it's an important topic. So I'm, I'm hoping I can cover it in this live stream and, and not have to make the video about it. <laughs> um, Clarice, do you know what the difference is between living off of dusty dirt road? Yeah, see, that's what I've always said. Who has said that, Clarice? Um, that's what I've always said. Like I worked for the Forest Service for 10 years and you know, you're out fighting fire and you're walking down a trail and there's a hundred other firefighters in front of you and the dust is just rolling up, right? And you're walking through that thick stuff and you've got a bandana around your face and you know it's barely cutting any of that. Um, and I'm like, I, I've been around dust or riding in the back of a pickup truck up a dirty dirt road and you're breathing dust all day. Is that the same thing? Um, because I've never heard of a country boy getting silicosis from living on a dirt road, but I mean, you live in the country, you breathe a lot of dust, you know, unless it's just rainy country, I guess. But uh, I'd like to know something about that because potters always make a big deal out of silicosis. But uh, people that live down dirt roads, you know, can breathe a lot of dust. People that work like farmers and, and, and cowboys and stuff, they breathe a lot of dust. Firefighters breathe a lot. Of, wildland firefighters breathe a lot of dust. So uh, that's a good point. Oh, like a porch. Uh, one comes and goes and the other goes round and round and round. <laughs> I know. I have no idea what that means. That's what I do too. Just don't breathe it. Wondering, are the standard paper masks helpful? Um, yeah, the paper masks are probably okay for dust, I would think. Um, probably not the best. Um, and, and I'm going to get into manganese later and, and, you know, lead. And definitely for things like that, you want like a good respirator. But for just d cutting the dust, I bet a paper mask would do pretty well. Although I'm not an expert on that, granny. Or even a bandana. Well, like I said, when I was a firefighter, we'd just tie a bandana around our face. The My employer, okay, this, this was a situation I was put in by my employer, the federal government of the United States at the time, and they didn't provide any protection for the dust. They didn't provide paper masks. We bought our own bandanas and tied around our face. So I always thought if it wasn't that big of an idea, a deal to OSHA, why is it that big of a deal? But, um, you know, like I said, it may be different. I, we just may not know the difference. I don't know. I'm not an expert. Um, dust is also a fire hazard. Um, no, 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 no. Like, like, um, like, like wheat, like flour dust in a mill is a fire hazard, but, but clay dust won't burn because it's, it's a mineral. Um, glazing can be the dirty, dusty bit. Oh, well, see, I don't, Potter's Journal says, Glazing can be dusty. I, I wouldn't know anything about it, but yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah, clay dust won't burn. It's, it's mineral. Uh, Clarice, no, because the fine particles still go through the mask. A respirator mask 
for small particles and fumes is best. Paper masks don't filter. It's okay. It's okay. I'm glad we've got some people here that know something about it because I, like I said, I was just, I was just assuming. Uh, in your channel is my request. Clay and mixing. Well, I'm, okay. Shin Chine Magic Poke Star. Um, you've been saying this ever since we started and I'm not getting it. So, um, clay and mixing marital? Marital? Like, like having to do with marriage? Ma what is that word? Clay and mixing marital video. I don't know what that means. Uh, puppet, but just a wearable sneeze shield. <laughs> uh, Granny Goose, thanks, Chris. Those silica particles are tiny. Uh, goodbye, Andy. I must leave. Oh, uh, good night, Straw Rope Factory. He's got to go to bed. He's got school in the morning. Have a great one, everyone. I'm glad you could show up. Uh, Granny Goose says the particle size is very fine. Mary McKinnon, I worked in a dusty scale yard and in a mill. Lots more dust there than any pottery I've done, and I do not have lung issues. Old Ugly, hey, you made it. Uh, another Albertan. Uh, I must also, unfortunately, leave. I must wake up early. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah, I appreciate that. I got some um, I got some people from, you know, over in Europe, and it's, it's late over there, so uh, I appreciate you guys showing up. Okay, uh, let's see. I've got some slides here. Uh, so this was the slide I had for you know, talking about clay. There's, there's your clay, Dustin. And I do process that stuff dry. Um, and, and there are issues with dry processing clay and in breathing that dust. You need to be aware of and, and try to mitigate those problems. Uh, you know, a good respirator is only like, you know, like 20 bucks you can get a good dust respirator. So uh, it's, not, it's not that it's really expensive or anything. It's worth it. Uh, otherwise, like I said, you can try doing it outside and, and trying to keep the dust down. Uh, so let's talk. I'm trying to look at my notes here. So give me a second. Let's talk about uh, now that we're done with the uh, the clay. Let's talk about pigment minerals. Okay. And this is what kind of um, uh, started this conversation. Yesterday, I posted on Facebook and said, I'm looking for a subject for my live stream. And somebody said, uh, you know, the, the toxicity or the safety related to the different pigment minerals you use. So I figured that was a good subject because um, it's good to know uh, which of these are, are safe to use for f food and which aren't. My, um, my mug here I'm drinking out of today is made with organic paint, which is uh, the best choice if you're going to be eating and drinking out of it because uh, the organic paint is made from a plant. It burns away and carbonizes in the fire and you're left with just carbon designs uh, like this. And so um, it's perfectly, perfectly food safe, uh, you know, unless the clay itself were dangerous in some way, but it's generally very safe. So that's, that's my first recommendation for food safety is uh, organic paint. But there's a lot of other options for, uh, for paint, and uh, we'll talk about some of those. So manganese, um, manganese is kind of the bad guy. Manganese um, is a really great black mineral paint, but it's also probably the most toxic of the mineral pigments uh, that I use and recommend. Um, I do use lead occasionally and I'll, and I will talk about lead, um, last. Um, so, so lead is probably the, you know, is the most dangerous, but, um, lead isn't that, I don't use lead that commonly. There's, there's a couple of specific pottery types that were made in the prehistoric Southwest that have lead based, uh, paint. Uh, but generally, for my blacks, I'm using manganese or copper carbonate. Uh, and now, here's what the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has to say about uh, manganese toxicity. Uh, workers may be harmed from exposure to manganese through the breathing of manganese fumes or dust. Continued exposure can damage the lungs, liver, and kidneys. Exposure to manganese dust or fumes can also lead to neurological condition called uh, hold on, I'm going to get this. Manganism, I think. Manganism's, manganism's symptoms, similar to those of Parkinson's disease, may include the following. Trembling, stiffness, slow motor movement, and potentially severe depression, anxiety, and hostility. The level of exposure depends upon the dose, duration, and work being done. So this has to do with inhaling manganese, not consuming it. So we're not talking yet about about manganese paint being eaten, you know, because it's on your dishes. We're just talking about inhaling the dust. And so uh, the first thing we want to talk about is when you're, when you're handling the powder. 
So you can you can find the rocks. I don't have one handy. Uh, manganese, I, I get it as a rock. Oh, I think I have a picture here. Hold on. Uh, so I collect it as a rock here on the, uh, on the photo. Um, and then I grind it up. I actually grind it in my corn grinder multiple times. So I'll, I'll crush it with a hammer till it's, you know, pea sized and put it through the corn grinder two or three times to, to get it finer and finer. Um, and then um, I will levigate it, uh, put it in water, let it settle, pour the fine stuff off, mix it, uh, let it settle, pour the fine stuff off. And that's how I got the little jar of powder that I have here. Now you can buy it already powdered as well. And I have a bag like that too. You can just go to Amazon and buy powdered manganese dioxide, which is exactly the same thing that I have here that I've made myself. So that by buying it, you're, you're eliminating the step of grinding it, which does produce dust. So uh, that's, that's one tip to avoid the dust. The other thing is if you're, if you're doing it, if you are grinding it, get a good respirator, you know, like we talked about, wear it while you're grinding it. And then like the, the, the tips we had for, for mitigating the clay dust, the same would apply for the manganese, right? Do it outside, um, clean up when you're done so that that any residual dust can settle overnight while you're not here. Um, you know, all those things, uh, wipe everything down with a wet rag, you know, get, mitigate that dust the best you can, uh, if you're going to grind your own manganese, there's nothing wrong. You, there's nothing wrong with grinding your own manganese. You just have to be aware and, and be, protect yourself. Okay. Now, once you've got it as a dust, once you've got it as a powder that you're going to use for paint, you still have to be aware of it, right? I mean, you're not going to try to, you're not going to stir it up. Like sometimes I open that bag. The, this is the stuff I made. The stuff I ordered from Amazon comes in a plastic sack. And sometimes if you just open that sack up like this, you know, this cloud of manganese dust comes out. So you need to be aware of that, right? You don't want to stick your face down in there. Um, and then, and then the other concern is once you have it painted on the pot, is it dangerous to eat it? So now we're going to talk about what happened, not just, not the dust. Now I'm going to talk about, do we want to consume it? Is it okay to eat it? Like if this pot was painted with manganese and I was drinking my coffee, would that be dangerous? Okay, this is, um, I don't remember. This one might be the same report. It might be CDC. I just don't, I don't know. I didn't write it down. Manganese, <laughs> here's the first, the first part about this that I thought was interesting. Manganese is ubiquitous in drinking water in the United States. So, um, here's the thing. Ma manganese is ubiquitous in drinking water in the United States. That means we're all drinking, well, all of us in the United States at any rate. And believe me, the United States, there's a lot of stories about, you know, drinking water in the United States, and I'm not here to defend it or anything, but drinking water in the high, United States is highly regulated uh, by EPA and, and, you know, the federal agencies. You have to meet all kinds of standards. So it's not just, it's not just well water. It, it is regulated. But you are drink if you're in the United States and you're drinking tap water, you're getting, you're getting manganese. So that tells me that, in some amount, manganese is safe to consume because it's in our drinking water. Manganese is ubiquitous in drinking water in the United States. While many of the studies reporting oral effects of excess manganese have limitations that preclude firm conclusions about the potential for adverse effects, these studies collectively suggest that ingestion of water and or foodstuffs containing increased concentrations of manganese may result result in adverse neurological effects. So what he's saying is um, there's not a lot of good studies that show absolutely, you know, but he says, well, this says taking all those studies in general together seem to point to some neurological damage that can happen from ingesting manganese. So um, I think what we can learn from this is that eating manganese is not nearly as dangerous as in inhaling manganese or or inhaling manganese fumes um but it can have negative effects so although it's not super toxic it's not like lead right um it's also something you probably want to avoid especially if and a lot of times this is the case you you've got your pot painted with manganese based mineral paint and you fired it and you like rub it with your finger and a little bit of black comes off, you know, maybe, maybe just, maybe not a lot, but a little bit, right? That, that shows you if it's a little bit fugitive, then every time you eat from it, you're getting a little of that in your, you know, in your diet. So, uh, it's probably not a good idea. I would avoid that. Uh, and it, and this is the, 
this is the most toxic of the chemicals that are regularly used. And I'll talk about some of the others now. Uh, so copper is the other one. Uh, copper, copper carbonate is commonly used to make black paint as well. Uh, this is purchased copper carbonate, uh, but you can also make it the same way you do manganese, and I do it the same way. I also wear a respirator when I do this, although it's not as toxic. I do like to protect myself from inhaling this junk if I don't have to. I mean, you don't need to get that stuff in your lungs if you, if you don't need to. So here's what, um, here's what I read about, about copper. With limited exposure, with limited exposure, copper is considered, considered relatively safe to use. However, when added to low lead solubility glazes, copper causes the solubility of the lead to be greatly increased. So if copper is in your lead-based glaze, it makes the lead more water soluble. So you'll get more lead in, in, your, um, in your food if the copper's part of it. Um, but that doesn't affect us, not with primitive pottery, because we're not making lead, but it's good to know. Um, solubility of glazes of other types can also be increased by the presence of copper. OSHA, oh, so OSHA, it, for those of you not in the United States, is Occupational uh, cell, Safety and Health. Uh, what's the A in OSHA? Occupational Safety and Health Administration, maybe? It's a government agency that protects, um, you know, people at work, workplace safety. Okay, OSHA does not consider copper exposure in the workplace to be a significant problem. At worst, they state that copper is an irritant, especially airborne. So it can, it can cause some, you know, irritation of your eyes or something if there's airborne copper. So copper carbonate is not, it's not super poisonous, right? You can basically uh, ingest a little bit of copper. You can inhale a little bit of copper. It's not going to kill you. Um, good to know, right? And now we'll talk about iron. And iron is... Um, less dangerous than copper. Uh, iron is, is used for all kinds of things though. For, for paint, I mean, the, most, the mineral I use the most of is probably iron, hematite, red ochre, these kind of things for red. Uh, and you, again, you can, you, can buy, you can find the rocks. Here's a, here's a hematite rock right here. You can get, go get the rocks and, and grind them up. Uh, or you can buy the stuff off of Amazon or someplace online and, and use it like that. Again, I grind my iron in the corn grinder in order to make uh, powder like this and I wear a respirator because you really don't want to be breathing that stuff if you don't have to Although as I'm going to show you, it's not it's not super dangerous So uh, here's what it said about iron according to the US Environmental Protection Agency Ingesting rust now iron oxide is just it's just rust. That's all it is ingesting rust in small amounts will not harm your health unless you have a rare disease called hemochromatosis which causes your internal organs to retain iron the Center for Disease Control and Prevention cautions against inhaling large amounts of rust, which can cause respiratory issues. In fact, iron oxide is used as a safe U.S. FDA-approved food coloring. So iron oxide is even used in our food as a, as a dye, as a colorant. So um, it, it, iron oxide is safe. Iron oxide is, sa is pretty safe to use then because it's FDA-approved in food as a pigment on your pottery because if you're ingesting a small amount of it, it's not considered harmful. So, good to know. My, my go-to, if I am going to eat off of it, is, uh, uh, like I said, the organic paint and then after that iron being the most, obviously, if it's approved by the um, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, it's, it's pretty safe stuff. Uh, and, and then copper in a lesser degree and then uh, manganese I keep my distance from. Uh, so let me go back to the uh, chat. Make sure I've got all the questions answered, and then I'll come back. We'll talk about lead a little bit. Uh, so where are we at? Xing John was saying goodbye. Old Ugly was here. Um, Ren Pixie, up here during the windy season, the dust is horrible. Can't keep the house clean to save my life. I bet. I bet. Uh, marital, similar to marriage, to mix together. I don't understand. Merit. Are we talking about mixing different clays together? I'm not still not sure what you're trying what you're asking for though if if we're talking about marital like marriage uh, to mix together I don't understand what kind of video you're requesting some of these pigments could be toxic yeah, well yeah that's what we're talking about correct spelling is marital you cannot pour manganese related compounds down the drain they have to be processed okay um Well, look, I, I pay money for manganese. I don't know why I would pour it down the drain, but um, like what about cleaning brushes, right? Um, 
I just dig a hole and pour it in my yard, honestly. I mean, it's it it's just it's just a mineral. Um, I want to try manganese. How best to choose a product for mineral paint? Okay, uh, Granny Goose. Um, here's my my fail safe uh recipe for black mineral paint uh for oxidizing atmospheres. Okay, um, one part copper carbonate, one part manganese. One part clay. That, that'll make a nice, that'll make a good black. So just get yourself some clay powder. You can take the clay you've used to make your pottery out of. And just grind it up so that it's a fine powder. Um, get yourself some carpet carbonate and some manganese dioxide. Use like a measuring spoon. You know, you could use like a little small quarter, quarter teaspoon or whatever. One scoop of copper carbonate, one scoop of manganese dioxide, one scoop of clay. Mix it all together, get it wet, paint it on. Uh, that should work real good. It is sold as manganese, no, mangan, yeah, Granny Goose, it's manganese dioxide is what you're looking for. Manganese dioxide powder. And sometimes when you buy it online, uh, it'll be in different, uh, different finenesses. So you want to get the, the most finely ground you can get. So if you're looking at it and there's different finenesses of grind, get the finest grind you can get. <coughs> um, big support from Serbia. Hey, thanks for showing up. Uh, thank you for this topic, Andy. I appreciate it. Thank you, Shrug65. I appreciate it. Uh, Clarice, most minerals can be bought in your local ceramic supply store, and they can usually order it too. There is pre-mixed with water, manganese, iron oxide, and other minerals for purchase. Oh, I never thought about buying it pre-mixed with water, but um, I don't know why I would do that. I mean, it's, it's easier to store dry and just wet it as you need it, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Um, yeah, you can buy it with ceramic supply stores and you can also buy it on, you know, you can buy online. You just go to Google and look, uh, manganese dioxide powder, type it in, you'll, you know, there's a hundred places that sell it. Um, so it, it's not hard to get. What about the risk of radiation? Um, yeah, no, I, there's not that much. I mean, it depends on where you live probably, right? I mean, you wouldn't want to be collecting clay next to a uranium mine, but uh, I think most places there's not that much. I mean, unless you live in Chernobyl or something, I don't think most places have a lot of radiation around. Um, there are, there are uranium mines in Arizona. I mean, I, I could go, I know where there's a uranium mine, uh, but I, obviously I don't collect clay there uh, or minerals. Uh, I have heard that some of the best yellow glaze is made from uranium. Um, Alexandra Lasky, are the organic pottery paints harmless? Greetings from Germany. Hey, Alexandra, the organic paints uh, burn, they combust in the firing and they turn into carbon. So it's just, it's just carbon. You know what I mean? It's like eating burnt toast. It's not really dangerous. It's, it's food safe. Yeah. Um, I want to see a video on your channel and my request, clay mixing material video. Okay. Clay mixing material. I don't know. I have a lot of videos where I'm mixing clay. So uh, maybe if you go to my, the I have like a wild clay playlist. There's a lot of videos of me mixing clay. Uh, in fact, my last pottery build where I made that Hoacom uh, burden basket carrier pot, I was mixing clay in that too. Uh, iron oxide is rust from iron. Yeah, iron oxide is just oxidized iron. Same thing as rust. In fact, you can make your own iron oxide from just scraping it off of rust. Uh, wonder about any good yellow color pigments. Oh yeah. Um, so this is, um, this is, um, oh, what do they call it? Um, um, limonite. Limonite is, is the same thing as, as hematite though. Limonite is just yellow. So it's, um, what is it? Chemically, this is, uh, iron oxide and this is iron hydroxide, I think. I, I'm not a chemist. Um, but but it's just about the same thing, and they both they will both turn red in a firing. So although it looks yellow now, it'll turn red when it's fired. Uh, and in a second, when I'm done with these comments, I'll run over and grab my canteen and show you. Um, when I see your cup, I want to drink cocoa. Oh yeah, I'm drinking I'm drinking a mocha in it today myself. Uh, Granny Goose, one part CC, one part manganese, copper carbonate, manganese dioxide, one part clay. Thanks. Yeah, that's the stuff, Granny Goose. Mary McKinnon, do you ever make a slop paint from your mineral paints when cleaning brushes, much like some studios do with glazes? No, no. Um, I just, as I'm done, 
when I'm done mixing with a particular paint, I just clean the palette and the brush and everything and, and move on. I do not do that. Uh, is it safe to drink from a cup with polymer clay? I don't know anything about polymer clay. I'm sorry, Isaac. Um, I just don't have any experience with polymer clay. Has anyone ever used the manganese inside old AA batteries? Oh, man, that sounds dangerous. I wouldn't do that. But hey, you know, to each their own. Um, yeah, let me go grab that yellow canteen. I'll be right back. Oh, I'm on the wrong, um, hold on. I've been on this same slide forever because I haven't been thinking. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, looking at that manganese slide the whole time. I apologize. Um, once I get talking, I forget all about the slides. So this is, um, this is a canteen. This is still damp. It isn't fired. Um, that I made for the Ancient Potters Club in December. Our project was uh, Pueblo Canteen. And so um, this is the one. I've, and it's still damp. It's still drying. Um, but this is slipped. This is made with a red clay. It's slipped with this yellow stuff. And then it's painted with uh, the manganese dioxide copper mix that I told uh, the recipe to Granny Goose. Uh, and then the white is just white clay. And so I'll fire this once it's dry. It's still, it's still damp. And then um, it'll turn red. It'll be black and white on red when it's done. So that's the yellow. Yeah, and, and you, it's hard to get yellow um, after firing. So um, the, best, the best thing I found is to get... Uh, like a clay that leans a little towards green and then sometimes it'll kind of fire to yellow. Oh, let me show you what else I'm working on. Um, if I can get the other camera. Okay, you with me? This is my, um, this is my sheep. I'm making this for a video. It'll be out in a couple weeks. So can you see the sheep? He's got legs down here too. I'm just trying to keep him drying evenly. So he's got, um, he's got plastic on his horns. He's got saran wrap on his tail and then I've got this bag around his legs because I'm just trying to dry the body without drying the appendages too much uh, so that's where I'm at my little sheep there um has anyone ever used the manganese oh I read that your large seed jar looks spectacular good job sending love from Texas I just found your channel yesterday and I love it thanks Aaron Andy, she was trying to say material. Cool to see a video on how you made that canteen. Um, yeah, there's no video on the canteen. It's actually two pookies. So I, I took a slab of clay, pressed it into a pookie, did it the same on two identical pookies, and then put them together. And then I, and then I cut you know a hole out of the side and you know attached the lugs and the, and built the neck. Uh, we did that in the Ancient Potters Club. That's our Wednesday night Zoom pottery class. Okay, uh, lead. So I, I do use lead sometimes on paint um, uh, because some of the some of the pottery from the ancient Arizona was made with a lead-based glaze paint. Not an all-over glaze, but a glaze paint. Um, and, and so that's one of those things that you, uh, you definitely don't want to put on anything that you're going to eat. I mean, I don't even have to quote stuff to tell you that lead is poisonous, right? Um, anything that's going to be eaten, you wouldn't want to have lead on it. You wouldn't put it on your coffee cup, right? Um, but not only that, you have to be careful. So I bought I bought a chunk of galena. Galena is, is lead ore, kind of silvery looking. I bought it at a rock shop. And I took it home, and I busted it up with a hammer, and I ran it through my corn grinder a few times. And I, I put it in like a mortar and pestle, and I ground it some more. And so I, I ground it into powder, but you need to be careful because, like, again, you don't want that lead powder in the air. You don't want to be inhaling it. So, again, respirator is a good idea. Um, I've never been able to get lead, this galena powder, into a, a really, really fine powder that, you know, is fluffy and, you know, easily airborne, like clay is. Um, now, maybe if you buy it, maybe you can buy, like, lead oxide or something that is like that. But generally, the stuff I have is, it's still a little gritty, a little, like, really fine sand. So it's not really something that I worry too much about getting in the air. But uh, some of that lead oxide, you know, commercial lead oxide might be like that, so... Be careful if you're using lead that you don't want to breathe it or ingest it. And you know what? The something I have a bad habit about is sticking paintbrushes in my mouth. So like, a lot of times I'll like hold the paintbrush in my mouth while I'm doing something with my hand, and I'll pick it up. And you know, like you don't want to be doing that if you've got lead on your brush. Now you can get it on your handle or your fingers, and then you touch the brush, and then it ends up in your. You know, I, I've been careless like that before, and that's just something I wanted to remind you that you know. You don't want to be uh, you don't want to be accidentally getting it in your mouth either. 
Um, so that's lead. Let's talk a little bit about um, let's talk a little bit about fire safety uh, before we're done here. Oh, there's that manganese picture you guys saw a lot of. Um, I had some other manganese. No, I had I had a copper picture. I had um, I forgot to run through. So there's my copper picture, and I had some iron pictures too. There's some different pots that are painted with um, iron oxide. The black is just a reduced iron oxide. Um, and then these are some examples of natural hematite uh, scrubbed on a rock there. So uh, pictures I forgot to, to play. And then um, let me talk a little bit about fire. So, like, you know, I mean, I don't have to tell you to be safe with fire, but be safe with fire. I, I'm, I'm telling you to, I'm showing you how to go out and, and fire pottery like this in the country, uh, but at the same time, you don't want to burn it down. So you just, you want to be careful that you're, if it's especially if it's really dry, you know you've got to be especially careful. Uh, you don't want to start a fire on a, when it's windy, uh, because you know it can blow embers and can blow flames and it get away from you. Um, they recommend clearing an area around your fire, ten foot around it, of all burnable materials. You know so that fire won't spread. Be aware that sometimes the ground, like in my area, this ground is all dirt. But if you live in a forest area, you could have a lot of duff where that fire can get down there and kind of smolder around and then come out later. So make sure you're down to, to sterile earth in that 10 foot radius. Um, and don't leave your fire unattended. You know, if you, if you've got a fire going, stay there with it and keep an eye on it. You don't take off. Um, and make sure when you're done that you put your fire completely out. Um, you know, pour water on it, mix it up with a shovel, the whole thing. Cause, um, you know, I don't know about where you live. I mean, other countries different. Some people told me, in fact, I talked to somebody from, from Poland who said, we're not even allowed to go out and build fires like that. Um, but, in, but here in the United States, um, if you start a fire like this and, and then it gets away from you, they'll send you the bill for all the firefighters going out and putting it out and everything. So uh, it can be really ugly if you happen to start a wildfire. Um, but the other thing I was going to talk about was the, <clears throat> the danger of, of toxicity. So... Um, and I get this comment on my videos every once in a while. So sometimes in a video, I will use a galvanized bucket as cover shirt. So sometimes I have broken pieces of pottery called cover shirts that I place around the pot that I'm firing to protect it from the fuel coming in contact with it. But sometimes if I don't have enough of those broken pieces of pottery, I'll just use an old metal bucket just to keep the fuel from falling down on the pot. Um, and if that bucket is galvanized, like a lot of them are, um, then it can produce uh, some toxic smoke that you can inhale. Um, did I have something on that here? I thought I did, but maybe I didn't. Hmm. Gal there it is, galvanized. Uh -huh. If I can get this done. So um, here's what here's what the uh, the in safety thing had to say about it. Inhalation of zinc, so galvanized is, is actually zinc. That's coating the steel to keep it from rusting, right? An inhalation of zinc oxide fumes can cause metal fume fever. This acute overexposure to zinc oxide through the respiratory system causes flu-like symptoms that can be severe. So I used to work as a welder. See, I keep telling you, I, I used to do this and I used, I used to raise sheep, right? I used to work as a welder. I've done a lot of things. I used to work as a welder and, uh, and I've, I've welded on things that were galvanized before. And what we would do is we would get a big fan and we would blow that fan towards the, the welding, you know, so then we would weld and then it would, the, the breeze would carry the fumes away from us so we wouldn't be inhaling those. And, and that's the same, right? If you're using a galvanized bucket for your cover shirts, lots of people do it. Uh, if you ever watch, um, there's a potter, there's a native potter here in Arizona named Ron Carlos and, uh, he posts a lot of stuff on uh, Facebook and Instagram of his making pottery and firing and such. Uh, you should look him up. He's a, <clears throat> he's a good guy and, and he's a, an excellent potter. Um, Ron Carlos always fires in a big, like a wash tub, a big galvanized tub. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a galvanized tub. Uh, but first of all, from what I understand, you, you burn all that galvanized you, uh, zinc. You oxidize all that zinc on the first firing. And then it's... Um, it's not, once you burned it once, it's not going to keep producing those fumes forever. At least that's my understanding. It doesn't happen consistently. Once that tub is burned, it's released all of its zinc fumes. At least that's what I've been told. 
Um, but, you know, <clears throat> don't stand down downwind of it, right? I mean, obviously, assuming you're firing in an open place outdoors, don't go stand in the smoke, right? I mean, do I have to tell you that smoke is also not good for you? So don't stick your head in the smoke. If you're standing around the fire and the smoke comes over by you, walk away from it. So in an open area, the amount of fumes coming off of that galvanized tub is not going to make you sick unless you're literally like right there because there's all that open space. It's all going up and <clears throat> spreading out. So like, obviously you can get sick from galvanized, <clears throat> especially when you're first firing it. But I mean, don't go stick your head in the smoke. Stand away from the fire. I mean, I, I know there's, you know, there's no accounting for how many dumb things people do. I mean, myself included. We all do dumb things all the time. So. Um, I, I do get a lot of comments on the galvanized thing. Oh, you're going to get sick. You shouldn't do that. Yeah, but, you know, be smart. Use common sense. Uh, don't stick your head in the smoke. <laughs> uh, wear a respirator. Uh, mix your clay outdoors, right? I'm, I'm not your mother, darn it. I shouldn't have to talk to you like this. <laughs> All righty. Let's see what we got on the uh, on the uh, chat here. Um, your large seed jar looks. Oh, I read that. Where am I at here? Oh man. Nature Morpho. Do you use the uranium from old smoke detectors? Uh, I No, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, I guess manganese oxide is dangerous anyhow. Nothing special about the one inside the spent batteries. Batteries are very alkali, so gloves are a good idea. <laughs> Well, it'd be an interesting video, that's for sure. How about green pigment? Uh, Hugh Sam says, how about green pigment? So uh, you can get green from copper. That's not uncommon, but it won't stay green in the firing. Uh, in fact, I have a video about green. You can look it up. I don't I don't think it's linked anywhere. Uh, just go to my, ch if you just go to my channel, my YouTube channel and type in like uh, green pigment or something like that, there's a whole video about it. If you see green paint on Southwest Pottery, uh, Mata Ortiz Pueblo Pottery, it's not uncommon these days to see green paint on either one of those. Uh, they're using a they're using a chemical underglaze that it's not it's not natural material. You cannot get green and in Southwest Pottery. There's no minerals in the Southwest that will turn green in a firing. If you see green, that tells you they're using chemical underglaze. Um. How long have you been watching AVE, Andy? I don't know what AVE is, Shrug65. Uh, you got to tell me what it is first. Uh, Angel, Duncan, do you ever paint some of the brighter raw colors like yellow after firing? Um, no, but you certainly could. Yeah, if you were just doing something purely decorative, um, you could mix up paint and paint. Like, you know, if you wanted green, you could mix up some of this with some organic binder, put it on after firing, and it, obviously it'd stay green. Or heck, you could paint on acrylic paint after firing and, you know, it'd stay that color too. So certainly could. I haven't. Um, and I think prehistorically it was pretty uncommon. I, I have seen a few examples in prehistoric pottery that, you know, where they were found in such a way that they were protected, like in a cave or something, and they had paint on them that was put on after, after firing. There's a particular one I remember that was a duck and they had painted his head green um, post firing, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's a rare day when my fireplace isn't too windy or wet. I love those rare days when the gods cooperate. Fire pit. Oh yeah. All right, everybody. Where are we at here? Time wise. Two oh three. All right. Uh, did I cover all your questions? Let me know if you've got anything else. Otherwise, uh, we'll wrap it up. Oh, you know what I didn't say? Um, give me a like if you would, please. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. It helped me with the algorithm quite a bit. And um, I appreciate all your questions and participation. If you have any, uh, if you have any more questions, let me know. I guess that's it. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming along with me. I'll catch you next time. <laughs>